we are live. Welcome to Moon Knight Episode 5 Thoughts. This episode is called Asylum. So, spoilers for the MCU leading up to this point, including this episode. And yeah, so this episode balances Mark and Steven's hearts by breaking all of ours. And we see Mark back in Dr. Harrow's office. You're right, it was a hippopotamus. And she talked. Do you think that is sense or nonsense? Makes a good point. Mark is resistant to treatment. They end up having to sedate him. And this is accurate. A lot of people are very resistant to mental health treatment. And to be fair, some mental health treatment is very upsetting. And I've, I've seen some say that, you know, that isn't Mark, that's Jake. That, I think, that might be, yeah. And, yeah, knocked out. We're back with the hippopotamus. This will really make you nervous. Would you still have broken it if I hadn't said anything? I really love her entire, like, you know, she has to get out the, the un unroll this par parchment. Welcome, traveler. Travelers. The, the whole thing just, yeah, really... Yeah. And Tyrett tells them they're in the Duat, the Egyptian afterlife. They didn't leave in very many MCU references. I do appreciate that Tyrett tells us she finds the ancestral plane gorgeous. I mean, she's not wrong. I like that, you know, Mark is like, oh, let, let me show you. This is just a, you know, this, this isn't, what is it? He thinks that they're still in the Asylum, I think, and he opens the door and see the the outside of the ship sailing through the desert sands. Awesome! And some people have pointed out we actually saw a ship in desert sands in Gus's fish tank. Very this this is a show with a lot of foreshadowing. Even when she's telling some them. Just, Telling them something terrible, she's still chipper and upbeat. She's telling them their souls will be denied heaven. She's like, nope, we can't have any, what was it, un unbalanced souls in the field of reeds. No, not so. It's just, yeah. Kill the hippo, steal the boat. That's your solution to everything. Kill the hippo. I jest, but seriously, it is good characterization. His first instinct is to use violence. Because that is all he thinks he's capable of. And they, they do a really good job. Like, it goes back and forth between being, you know, something they joke about because it's the MCU. And something taken seriously. And it has, like, from the start, from, like, I, I want to say second episode is the first time. Steven has always been saying that Mark is too violent. And actually, in at the end of episode two, it's it's triggering for Mark to, for Steven to call him like a, ki a killer or something like that, you know, and yeah, like, because when someone tells him he's a killer, that that's all he can do, it reminds him of his brother drowning and his mother blaming him for it. If there really is an afterlife, I hope I end up in the duet. Tarot is adorable. And we're told they have to balance their scales before they reach their destination. And Mark remembers each of the dead people by where he killed them. And, you know, and Stephen is like, you remember all of these people. And Mark is like, you try killing someone and then see how, see if you can forget about it or something like that. Which, you know, also similar to, to Bucky. So, I, yeah, I really appreciate that the MCU is acknowledging how hard that is. Because I don't know it from... I don't know it from personal experience, but that is what people who have killed say, that it, it stays with them. You know, they wake up in the night remembering the, the, the look on the face of the person. So, yeah. And, and yeah, it's... it's yeah, to, I'll finish that thought in a second. Mark says that all of them were criminals. Khonshu wanted punished. But clearly, even he doesn't think that makes all this killing okay. I really appreciate the MCU tackling this, because let's be honest, a lot of the MCU heroes have killed a lot of people. 
Wishing I failed, one of them would kill me instead. The healing ended up being a curse. Who is hungry? Roro? Well, Roro prefers to eat cereal and milk separate. And, yeah. We find out when Mark was a child, he was watching his younger brother Roro. His brother drowned. His mother blamed him for it for the rest of their lives. No wonder he has issues. And Mark continues to try to talk Stephen out of further exploring his memories, but to no avail. And we see that at least one of the birthdays, Wendy sits out entirely, and another one, she comes in drunk, basically tells him she thinks he killed his brother out of jealousy. You know, she's gone from, at, at first she says, this is your fault. You, uh, uh, yeah, you know. And and later she says, I, I, I don't think she were, uses the word kill, but she says something like, you did this. Not you let this happen, but you did this. So, yeah. And I, th I think it was New Rockstar who pointed out, you know, if you're carrying a, a glass of liquor and a, a thing to to refill the glass, as soon as the glass, as soon as you've had what's in the glass, you you might have a drinking problem. And Stephen insists that their mother wasn't like that. I've heard some people theorize that Jake was the one who took the hits, which is why he's so such a hardened person. That makes a lot of sense. Mark confirms that his partner was Bushman, just like the theories have said. And Mark was about to put a bullet in his head. There was a deleted scene of this for the Incredible Hulk movie, which was referenced in The Avengers, but you actually see it seriously considered here. They really are pushing what they can show. And, you know, in the Avengers, he phrases it, I put a bullet in my mouth. You know, he doesn't say, I shot myself. And, you know, the, the riff tracks hilariously pokes fun at the phrasing by saying, in retrospect, I probably should have fired the bullet from a gun. But, yeah, it's... They, they really are getting dark. He was manipulating me from the start. Maybe he just kept me what I always was, a killer. And we see a lot of souls are being judged before their time, which Tyrod says is wrong, evil. So, you know, depending on who you ask, it's either Arthur releasing Ahmed, or he's judging a lot of people with the cane. My first thought was Ahmed, but I guess it's possible it's the cane... It just looked too fast for, you know, the cane is a one person per kind of deal, but Ahmed might, yeah. And he wakes up in Dr. Harrow's office again. And Dr. Harrow says they didn't sedate him and his nose is longer hurt, band-aided. Harrow confirms that he's been reliving all these memories. And Dr. Harrow questions if Mark or Steven were the original personality. It's not my mom. And we see Mark creating Steven. And the movie Tomb Buster is real. And that really is where he got the name Steven Grant. Which, apparently in the comics, it is actually Indiana Jones. I think it makes a lot of sense. I'm not, I'm not saying it's wrong in the comic. I, I think it was a good choice for adapting that they made it this cheesy... Z-grade movie, because when he goes around saying, introducing himself as Stephen Grant, people aren't like, from the movie? C come on, be serious. If he went around saying, Indiana Jones, pleased to meet you, you know, it's that's going to raise eyebrows. He's not going to get a job if he introduces himself as that. People are going to not take him seriously, you know. And it also does, like... The, the, I mean, I guess hypothetically they could have said that Indiana Jones in the MCU is called Stephen Grant. So, you know, the, yeah, it makes sense that it's a movie nobody's seen. So nobody's heard that name before. You do not need to see that. That's the whole point of you. And I really appreciate the, the, we see how triggering it is 
for Stephen when Mark says that she's still alive, you know, that Stephen thinks she's still alive. That is something that, you know, Stephen has been upset by various things over the course of the episode up to this point already, but that's that's a bridge too far. That's just something he's not going to accept. And he wakes up in Dr. Harrow's office, and because of the shock, he throws the glass of water in his face. It's it's very Ned Flanders. Yeah, kind of. Someone pointed out that it actually looks a lot like Stan Lee, which I very much appreciate. And yeah, Stephen freaks out at the idea that his mother's dead. He starts by saying, and and Harrow, you know, is, oh, you know what? I'm wrong. I'm, I, I'm, you're right. She's still alive. And, you know, calls, and, and it's apparently Dylan who makes the call for him, and, you know, Dylan that he didn't realize in the first episode that he was going on a date with. And, you know, the, the, yeah, he hands Stephen the phone, and Stephen accepts, you know, she is dead. And we see Mark at the Shiva, but he can't go in. Now. And they reach the gates of Osiris. The unclaimed souls of the Duat must now claim yours. And Mark is being dragged from the boat by the souls of the people killed. Yikes. And they're like, they got weapons they're throwing tomatoes and like pineapples at them and Stephen fights to protect Mark six I prefer cricket <laughs> and Stephen accidentally went overboard trying to save Mark and tries to run but ends up becoming a statue horrifying and you know in the first episode the little girl did say did it suck for you getting rejected from the field of reeds? Which I guess means on some level he knew this would end up happening. And the scales balanced. Mark gets into the field of reeds and the episode ends. And I forget who, but someone here on YouTube pointed out that when he, you know, as, as soon as it happens, he just, he's instantly in the field of reeds as if he's always been there. So this is the penultimate episode of the series, and it backfills backstory, so like WandaVision, and it is an episode late in the season where one of the leads appears to die pretty much right before the end credits play, so like season one of Loki. This episode works as well as it does in part because of Oscar Isaac's brilliant performance. It wouldn't have worked at all if it was a bad performance. And don't get me wrong, directing... Editing, cinematography, all of it is excellent. The the effects, like, if we... There are times where Tower It isn't completely convincing, but they're, they're good bordering on great. And, yeah. I hate to say it, but I am a little worried that this is going to be another MCU show where the finale is in a rush to deal with everything. I guess really Loki season one is the only one that is entirely unlike. Well, uh, the the season one episode of the what if wasn't too bad, I guess. But yeah, the the other ones kind. Of... Oh, actually, yeah, I guess the Captain America and the Winter Soldier wasn't too bad either. Anyway. The show did a really good job convincing us that Steven was the original identity. This con this episode confirms that Mark was... You know, a lot of people had guessed it. And it is, as far as I know, in the comics, Mark also was. So, you know, not everybody was surprised by it, but they have changed things for the MCU. So it could have been, you know... And, yeah, like, the fact that at first we're introduced to Steven. Steven sometimes has blackouts. You know, he sleepwalks. But the, you know, it is, it's told to us from his perspective. So we are led to believe that he is the original. 
so we're told that Taurat can send Mark back to his body, you know, if she has that power, but if it isn't healed, that, you know, yeah, they'll just be going back to a dead body. Kanshu can heal the body, but is currently trapped, so I guess in the finale, Layla is going to free Kanshu, he'll heal the body, Taurat will send Mark back, and Mark will suit up some of the soup and defeat Arthur. And, you know, we see in the trailer, there's this shot where Moon Knight and Arthur jump at each other on the top of a, a rooftop. I really hope that the finale doesn't turn Arthur into a 2D cartoon villain the way that WandaVision did to Agatha Harkness. The, you know, he's been so interesting up to this point. So, yeah. So, I... In this episode and the penultimate episode of WandaVision, in both cases, the the flashbacks hit really hard. I really appreciate that in both cases, it's like the lead is, ex I guess, I guess in this case, not experienced. They, they've entered the flashback. They're they're, you know, Mark and Stephen are always. I, uh, is it just Stephen? And anyway. The, you know, very close to the events. It's not just that the, yeah, you know, it, it used to be, if if you can remember the before times, flashbacks was just like, you know, a, a character would be like, I remember and look upwards and there would be a shimmering effect and then we, we, the audience, would see the flashback. And, you know, to be fair, that used to be what special effects were able to accomplish. But today, yeah, it just, it hits harder when you see, you know, you see Steven, like, when he, when he's, like, saying, we have to clean up the room or mum will be upset. And when Steven is like, why are you remembering her this way? She wasn't like this, you know, that, that kind of thing. It just, it hits so much harder than if we get a flashback and then it goes back to them and then they're having that conversation, you know. I'm not sure I would say, I, th I think they're about evenly matched, the the flashbacks. I suppose if I had to, the, the, hmm. No, yeah, I, I would say they're, they're, both episodes are really devastating. You know, I, I just rewatched WandaVision since Doctor Strange 2 is coming out. But yeah, they, they both are. Both episodes are really devastating. Now, this episode mentions Bushman. In the comics, he doesn't have any superpowers, same as in the comics Moon Knight. I can imagine they'll give him superpowers so that he's a match for Moon Knight. But yeah, you know, like if they do Midnight Suns, maybe Bushman will like be in charge of whatever they get. actually I'm I can't help but wonder if maybe the Midnight Suns who if you don't know handle the Marvel Universe's supernatural threats you know they're they're more anti-heroes than out and out good guys but yeah you know and other characters that you know Black Knight is already greatly hinted as being in the MCU by Eternals Blade has an off-screen voice cameo at the end of uh, ah, one of the post credit scenes of Eternals. They're three of the members of the Midnight Suns, and Ghost Rider is another, and I believe they have the rights for that character as well, and I, uh, Werewolf by Night, you know, various supernatural. so yeah, it would make a lot of sense if they were, you know, if, if this group attacked some major supernatural threat. And I can't help but wonder if it might be Marvel Zombies, because we know we're getting Marvel Zombies. That's getting its own separate show. And, you know, it's not, you, you can't just have a bunch of people running around with guns, like in a lot of, 
zombie stories because these zombies have superpowers. We, you know, that was confirmed in the What If episode that had the Marvel zombies. So, yeah, it makes a lot of sense for it to be these experts on the supernatural fighting, you know, all the zombies of the Marvel. It's, it's good. I, I don't want to get my hopes up because it might not be that, but I think it would make a lot of sense. But, and, you know, Rick, I, I don't, I'm super psyched for Marvel Zombies just in general. I, I, I really love that they're actually doing these horror concepts. Now, so yeah, I already mentioned that part of making Moon Knight way less a Batman than he is in the comics is in part because we just got an excellent Batman movie and, you know, there, an argument could be made it's the best live-action Batman movie so that we've gotten up to this point. It could also be the MCU doesn't have a lot of ground level, street level superheroes. Like even Hawkeye has trick arrows. Black Widow, either of them, is an expert in espionage in addition to a really good fighter with some gadgets. You know, now to be fair, Batman, in addition to that, is also an amazing detective. But I just don't, I don't think we're gonna get such a street level, you know, major. Yeah, it. it I. I just don't say like. You know, Sam Wilson doesn't have superpowers, but he has a wingsuit, which can, like, block explosions, and, you know, it's it's just, I, I don't think we're gonna get, you know, I, I yeah, the, the closest we've ever gotten to a real street level is Black Widow and Hawkeye, and, you know, Black Widow does manage, like, if not for her... Hulk might not be part of the climax of Age of Ultron. Can you even imagine? There's no way they would have won without him. And he... Uh, let's see. Black Widow was also the person who realized that Loki's plan involved unleashing the Hulk on the helicarrier. You know, these are things that just... Yeah. And, again, Batman could have done those things as well. But I just don't, I, I think they are going to try to focus more on these, you know, super, like, we also, like, we just got Shang-Chi, and, like, in the comics, he's an incredible fighter, but I'm pretty sure he doesn't have the Ten Rings, but they made that choice, they made the choice that he would have the Ten Rings, so clearly they're not, they're not that interested in street level, uh, yeah. I really appreciate that this episode confirmed that Mark is Jewish, like in the comics. He wears a yarmulke in the street when he doesn't join the Shiva. More diversity. Great to see it. Excellent acting from everyone in this episode. I want to highlight the child playing Mark and Stephen and the actress playing his mother, who goes from warm and loving to cruel in addition to... I already mentioned Oscar Isaac giving an incredible performance. Now... I did see one critic saying, I, th I think it was uh, Sean Chandler Talks Movies, not a lot of Moon Knight in this episode or in this entire show so far, considering he's the titular character. That That is a good point. Yeah. Um, I'm hoping that in the future we get much more, you know, but yeah, if for, for sure. It's, that that is a really good point. The the There really hasn't been very much. I guess it's possible that the finale will help make up for it, the way that the finale of WandaVision, you know, I didn't need WandaVision to ever turn into an action show, but it did bother me a little that, like, they said during press tour, oh, it's partly a an action show, you know, and there was just episode after episode with basically no action. There would be a little bit of action here and there. And then, you know, the, the finale, oh, this was what they were talking about. Okay, yeah, this this is an action, you know, the, a lot of action in the finale there. But yeah, the, the I have, I think there's a, a chance that they'll do a really great job on the, on the finale. I hope that it's not nonstop action without addressing, like, complex issues. You know, the, the show brought up this whole pre-crime thing. I hope that will get a relatively satisfactory, you know, con conclusion. 
and yeah, I, you know, I hope it's not non-stop talking like the finale of season one of Loki kind of what I love that episode, but man, it was a lot of talking. I think it was Dan Casey who said he who remains becomes he who explains. Yeah, it's, it's still a great episode. I, I can't hate an episode that makes me terrified of Miss Minutes. Especially when all she actually, like, she shows up and she's just, hi, y'all. and But they made the eyes, like, and just the, and the jump scare effect of it. Just, yeah, it, suddenly she's right out of a horror movie. Even though at first she was like, okay, she'd occasionally very casually say really threatening things. But she wasn't terrifying before that point. Anyway, yeah, I, I'm i really looking forward to the finale. And yeah, I... Yeah, that's it for this video. So catch you next week.